wanted a Democrat to come, but I, I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order, okay? Because we've got a quorum here, and he has, a, they have, he has a markup they're trying to get back to. Okay? Okay, thanks. The uh, Rules Committee will come to order. We're here for consideration of H.R. 2017, the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Act of 2012. The reason I've called the uh, committee to order now is that Mr. Price has just informed me that they uh, have a markup that they're in the midst of, and I would like to have our Democratic colleagues here as we celebrate what will be the first open rule of this Congress. And um, I uh, hope uh, someone quipped that they may be protesting the first open rule here uh, that we're, we're having. I hope that's uh, not the case. But uh, we are um, happy to welcome the distinguished chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Adderholt, and the ranking member, my uh, good friend, uh, Mr. Price. So, Mr. Adderholt, please proceed without objection. Any prepared statements you have will appear in the record in its entirety. Thank you. It's all on. Say okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, I am pleased to hear, be here to testify on behalf of a rule for the consideration of Homeland Security Appropriation Bill for FY 2012. Uh, as reported by the Appropriations Committee, the bill provides $40.6 billion in discretionary funding, almost $3 billion or 7 percent below the request, and $1 billion or almost 3 percent below the fiscal year 2011 level. The bill is within the uh, subcommittee's 302B allocation for the authority and the outlays in the interest of time. Uh, I, will, I won't outline all the programs uh, that uh, are in the bill, but uh, I would like to have highlight uh, a few points. This bill uh, puts priority on the taxpayers' limited dollars toward the security programs that will have an immediate impact upon our nation's security and responsibly reduces spending where, wherever possible. The bill is constructed around three core principles. Number one, fiscal dis discipline. Number two, targeted investments in security operations and disaster relief. And three, meaningful, hard-hitting oversight. Uh, first, physical, on physical discipline, uh, this bill goes further than simply, simply uh, spending cuts. The bill insists upon rural reforms. Reform is, is how the Department justifies its budget. Reform is how FEMA manages first responder grants. And reform is how FEMA budgets for the cost of disaster relief. Number two, on security, this bill includes nearly $150 million worth of target investments above the request of for security operations. The frontline programs that keep our nation secure and, these, and those activities that directly counter current terrorist tactics and known threats. On disaster relief, I've seen firsthand the impact of horrific disasters, and I can tell you that my constituents in Alabama are expecting FEMA to get it right. So this bill picks up from where we left off on FY11 and provides an increase of $850 million above the request and within the budget for FEMA's disaster relief fund to address the known and expected cost of disasters for FY 2012. Then, as adopted by a, vi by a voice vote in our full committee just last week, the bill includes an additional $1 billion in supplemental funding for disaster release, relief upon enactment to ensure FEMA has the resources to sustain its recovery operations this year. This supplemental funding is entirely offset by unused FY 2009 funds. And number three, finally, on oversight. This subcommittee uh, has a long tradition of insisting upon results for each and every taxpayer dollars that is appropriated. The bill and the report include numerous spend plan requirements, reporting requirements, and operational requirements such as border patrol staffing levels and an increase to ICE detention capacity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I sincerely believe this bill reflects our best efforts to address our nation's most urgent needs, security and fiscal discipline, and I urge my colleagues to support it. Let me close by thanking my uh, friend and colleague uh, and partner in all this, uh, Mr. Price. He's been a true statesman, and uh, we have worked together in this uh, turbulent year in a uh, truly uh, uh, partnership, and I look forward to working with him as we complete this vital bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm requesting an open rule waiving all necessary points of order against the bill, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions that you or Ms. Slaughter uh, or other members of the subcommittee 
or of the committee might have. So thank you. Thank you very Chairman. much, Mr. Redhold. Mr. Price. Mr. Chairman, Madam Ranking Member, other colleagues, I'm pleased we'll be considering fiscal 2012 Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill on the floor tomorrow. Uh, Chairman Adderholt has been a true professional in the drafting of this bill. I'm appreciative of his willingness to include input from our side all along the way. I'm here to testify in support of the committee's request for an open rule because I believe all members should have a chance to improve this bill. The bill decreases funding for the Department of Homeland Security by 6.8 percent below the President's request and essentially returns funding back to, back to the 2009 level, which is concerning to a lot of people, including myself. I appreciate that Chairman Adderholt was able to retain adequate funding for the frontline employees of the Department of Homeland Security to continue conducting critical operations along our borders to protect our nation's airports and seaports and to respond to the spate of natural disasters our country has experienced this spring. But I'm deeply troubled by deep and devastating cuts to Homeland Security grant programs. Providing a total of $1 billion for all state and local grants, 65 percent below the request. And providing $350 million for firefighter assistance grants, almost 50 percent below an already reduced request, breaks faith with states and localities that depend on us as partners to secure our communities. These cuts will be doubly disruptive as many of our states and municipalities are being forced to slash their own budgets. And these cuts come on top of cuts to grants in the fiscal year 2011 appropriation. The bill also cuts funding for Homeland Security research activities in half. That's research in cybersecurity and other critical areas. It makes drastic reductions to construction activities, including funds for the new DHS headquarters that uh, had already been under construction. But the cuts to state and local programs are the most serious flaw. These funds equip our state and local partners to be ready for a disaster so they can mitigate its impact and respond effectively. This bill rightly seeks to help states and localities rebuild after a disaster strikes with supplemental funding for disaster relief, but it decimates the work required to prepare for a disaster before it happens. Supplemental funding for disaster relief has traditionally been considered as emergency spending. But the increase over the President's request for disaster relief in this bill comes out of the height of first responder grants, firefighter equipment and personnel grants, state homeland security formula grants, urban area security grants, and port rail and transit security grants, pitting our first responders against the needs of disaster-stricken communities is a false choice. The Rules Committee can correct this false choice today by making in order and providing the appropriate waivers to allow me to offer amendments to restore funding for the first responders by designating funding for disaster relief that is above the President's request, the increment in funding, designating that as we have on a bipartisan basis in the past, designating that as emergency spending. This would then let us uh, apply the, uh, the funds that are, that are freed up to, uh, not, not for lavish, uh, first responder funding, but for level funding, level funding for uh, the, uh, the first responder grants that I, uh, that I mentioned. This is a simple measure the Rules Committee can take that will permit me and other members to support this bill, which I'm sorry to say we simply cannot support in its uh, current form. Again, again, because of this major flaw and other shortfalls in the bill, I request an open rule so members will have the chance to perfect it including an amendment I plan to offer on firefighters. And I ask for your serious consideration of the waiver I just described to permit me to offer uh, my other amendments. Now, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Price. Thanks to both of you. And um, I will say that I'm going to recommend to this committee that we do exactly what you have, have both uh, asked uh, of us, and that is I'm going to recommend that there be an open rule. July 31st of 2007 is the last time we had when there are 119 members of the 112th Congress, including six members of this committee who have not yet had the opportunity to experience an open rule. As you know, we've had uh, a wide range of legislation that has been considered uh, under a modified open uh, rule, which simply has required a preprinting of amendments the night before in the congressional record. But uh, this will be the first open rule, uh, assuming that the committee follows my encouragement on this and the encouragement of, of uh, Speaker Boehner on it. It also doesn't include earmarks. I mean, I will say, Mr. Price, I'm very sympathetic with what it is that you'd like to do, but if your request is met, it wouldn't be an open rule. And um, that is part of the challenge that, that we face here, because 
while we're going to provide protecting for the underlying work product of your subcommittee and the full committee, uh, for this committee to take that kind of extraordinary action would would nullify the open amendment process. So it would not be considered an open rule if we were to take that action. And um, I, I think that this is just further evidence of the kinds of very, very tough challenges that we're facing. And, and I understand that. But I have no questions. And again, appreciate well, Mr. Chairman, your work if I, together. If, sure. if I might, on your, on your point, I, I don't, um, I'm afraid I don't grasp that. Uh, it would require waivers to provide the kind of extraordinary request that you have made, and by virtue of that, this would not be considered an open rule then if we were to do that. It would be uh, going beyond the open rule uh, that we have. Would it be an opener rule? <laughs> <laughs> That's so that would be my argument, an opener rule. It would uh, provide waivers, provide waivers in, in right. In, uh, Again, what we're doing with is mass bipartisan what, practice what we're doing, what has been the, the, the bipartisan yeah. tradition, and that is providing the protection for the bill itself, the work yeah. product, I said, of the subcommittee and the full committee that has come forward. And, uh, I mean, as you know, the bill itself is privileged, and you don't need to come to the Rules Committee for consideration of any appropriations bill on the House floor. It means that any item that is within the bill could, in fact, be stricken. Uh, on points of order that are raised. And so we do provide this protection for the work product of the committee itself. But uh, to do what you're asking is uh, an extraordinary step. And I understand, and you've made a very compelling case about the urgency of this, but I just think it's important to note that we, we would not be considering the, the, uh, the bill under uh, an open amendment process if we were to do that. But I do thank you both, again, for your very hard work and your diligence and your commitment to dealing with what obviously is um, one of the most important uh, appropriations items that we, uh, that we address. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dave, thanks for coming up here and uh, meeting with us. I, it's probably an unusual thing to hear Rules Committee Chairman say we're going to have an open rule, but I, I believe that this committee is committed to that. Um, I appreciate you coming up and uh, taking time to let us hear your ideas. Robert, I, Mr. Adholt, Chairman, I want to thank you for not only delivering what appears to be a $3 billion cut, but perhaps uh, more importantly, you hearing from the Rules Committee that we appreciate the Appropriations Committee getting this. Uh, your leadership, you finding, making, finding things that have to be cut, making tough decisions, working with the administration, letting them know how important it is. I, I, I did hear Mr. Price very eloquently say it's a kind of a double hit. That states are having to do these same things, too. I would note that that's probably true because their state constitutions require them, most of them have balanced budgets. Ours should too. We should be limited in the actions that we take on behalf of the American people. And uh, quite honestly, I'm very pleased with your leadership, your ability to not only represent the committee, but I hope that you will go back and reinforce to other subcommittee chairs that will be before us that I was well received by the Rules Committee. They seem to be in favor of what we did, and they recognize not only the heavy lifting and the hard work, but we finally, instead of just giving, giving, giving more and more and more, we're now, from the Appropriations Committee, making tough decisions that every member of Congress uh, is going to have to listen to us on, and there will be an open amendment process where if they disagree with what we did, then let the will of the House uh, prevail. But I'm very proud of what you've done, and Thank I hope you. you'll go back and... I'd even go home and tell Mary Elliott tonight uh, what a great job you did. She's, she's uh, been on, impressed with On behalf of, uh, of, uh, of the people of Alabama. Yeah, well, you know, there are some hard decisions to make, but we realize that uh, Homeland Security cannot be uh, one of the, the committees that, or subcommittees that's going to be immune from uh, any, any cuts. So we realize that we have to cut. Uh, what we're trying to do is make sure that the cuts that we make are smart and make sure that they uh, overall best interest. I think... Uh, the, some of the things that Mr. Price is talking about, they're important to all of us, but uh, considering the situation we're in overall, that's where the cuts, uh, we've got to make cuts somewhere, and we feel like overall that this is probably the, 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 probably the least uh, detrimental way to make cuts. So um, thank you for your uh, kind words. Well, the facts of the case are not very simple, but we, most of us remember on 9-11 when it happened. You were here. Uh, Chairman Dreyer was here. Most members of this committee, at least on to my right, were here. Uh, and I remember the conversations that were rather open on a bipartisan basis where we talked about uh, us being hit again. 
And I think mo most members of Congress were very concerned about that. I think the administration then, I think the administration now is trying to forthrightly work to avoid that happening. It could happen at any day. We've seen that. But what I would call a peace dividend should come from 10 years' worth of appropriations to where we, at some point, don't seed ground, but rather own ground, and don't have to keep spending a tremendous amount of money, but rather have the confidence and knowledge we're now doing a great job. And now we can see the peace dividend, just as what we talk about overseas uh, with our troops, that we are more efficient. We now know what the target is. We have now got in place not only uh, subject matter experts who can realistically tell us how to make efficiency work, but that the United States Congress can work from a sense of strength rather than fear uh, on this issue. And I think that that strength is embodied in what you have done. Uh, and I want to include the gentleman from North Carolina in there because you mentioned his stellar service to the committee uh, on a bipartisan basis. And so I think everybody should get credit uh, for a job well done. I thank the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you both. Uh, I know how hard both of you work and, and that you are persons of substance, but I do want to describe an open rule here. Under an open rule, this is for your benefit, Mr. Price, any member may offer an amendment that complies with the standing rules of the House and the Budget Act. Also included in the category of open rules are all those special rules referred to as open plus, which I mentioned a moment ago. These rules allow the offering of any amendment normally in order under an open rule plus the consideration of any amendments for which waivers of points of order have been granted by the special rules. So it is possible for us to do that. And I want to thank you very much for doing this. Uh, I represent the northernmost border that we have in the country. It's part of New York. Uh, and every cent of our money, every bit of it, from Buffalo to Albany, has been taken away by this measure. And I am certainly sympathetic for the areas that are underwater and the devastation of those tornadoes. But we've never, in my memory, paid for disaster money by taking away from someplace else where it's really needed. Uh, and and I, I really share your concern. And I don't know if many people remember it or not, but uh, shortly uh, after 9-11, uh, six young men were arrested in Lackawanna, New York, an Erie County suburb of Buffalo, uh, for having trained with Al Qaeda. Um, and a previous Secretary of Homeland Security told me, flat out, that in his opinion, Buffalo, New York, was the most dangerous place in the United States. I don't agree with that. Let me say that to you. Uh, I. Uh, I, this same person gave no money to New York State, under, uh, New York City under the grounds there was nothing there to protect. So obviously we could not agree on that idea. Uh, and we tried very hard to do uh, open borders or trade border management so that we could uh, work with Canadians. And I've always felt if you couldn't work with Canadians, you can't work with anybody. But we certainly do need money. We need to keep our first responders alert. We need to keep them going. And to, uh, to say that that whole border that borders on Lake Ontario, on Ontario is of no interest to Homeland Security, I must say, makes no sense to me. And I, I will certainly support, Mr. Price, your ability to get the waiver and put these two to let the uh, House vote its will. Um, I, it's, uh, for us, it was, it was quite a blow to, to learn that suddenly we'd gone from uh, high dangers, which I thought was an exaggeration, to nothing at all, which is a major exaggeration, that we have no need on that northern border uh, for Homeland Security in, in effect. So thank you very much. No. Thank you. And let me just say there are, uh, there are problems, uh, big problems, with the budget resolution, as, as we all know, and as subsequent bills are going to demonstrate even more. And so, um, Obviously, my, my desire would be for a greater allocation, but I've refrained from uh, proposing that. I've, I've chosen to ask for a waiver that I think is grantable. It, it simply would restore the traditional bipartisan treatment of disaster funding as emergency funding. Not, not all of it, but only that portion of it that is above the President's request that's in this bill. Having done that, then we would have just barely enough funding to, uh, to hold 
hold harmless, to, to basically keep level the funding for the urban area grants, the fire grants, and so forth. So that's, that's what I'm asking. It's certainly not a, uh, not a request for lavish funding or increases in any, in any of this funding. It's simply a way that I see through this uh, dilemma that I believe is um, widely recognized on both sides of the aisle. And I think many of us, if you go back and look at the problems of Lackawanna 6, realize that homegrown terrorism is a possibility and that we need that support uh, in our areas to be able to deal with that as well. I thank you very much for your amendments. I appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank um, both the um, uh, subcommittee chairman and ranking member for being here and for their hard work, and I have no questions. Thank you. I want to thank both of you for your, for your hard work, um, and I, I want to support Mr. Price's request because, uh, you know, we, yes, we all want quantity when it comes to amendments, but we also want quality, too. Um, and we want the, our, these debates to be able to reflect, you know, where there are, you know, where, where the true issues of contention may lie, and, um, and I think he, uh, he should be, re be granted a waiver to be able to offer his amendment. I, I also say, I, I assume we're, all, we're operating under the, uh, under the guidance of the Ryan budget here, here uh, as we move through these appropriations process, uh, uh, bills, which, to be honest with you, I, I find deeply troubling. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think the cuts are not well thought out, and I do think that the, the deep cuts in, in Homeland Security are, are, are problematic, and we're going to end up paying for it if we start in ways that, um, that we don't, that we, that it's hard to quantify right now if we, if we start to pull back on some of, the, on some of this funding. But again, I, and I, I sound like I bring this up all the time. When people talk about these are, these are tough times, we have to make tough decisions, I, I remind you that we're borrowing $8.2 billion a month, borrowing to pay for our military operations in Afghanistan. No one's, no one's suggesting, I wish they would, that we either pay for that you know, or get out, which I think we should get out. But I, it just bothers me that when it comes to trying to balance the budget, rather than looking there, we look at firefighters uh, in this case. Uh, we look at people who are, quite frankly, uh, who, are, who are struggling. And um, you know, I think there's a better way to do all this. So I, I strongly object to the Ryan budget, and if that's what this reflects, I think this is a this is a, a this is a bad policy. Thank you. Are you back by time? Uh, I'd just like to thank you all for doing this. And just a quick perusal of uh, of the report that you filed. It seems like you have done an amazing job with limitations that you had, and looking forward to the future. So I appreciate your efforts. I think it's always difficult being the first budget before the rules committee and the first one to go on the floor. But you'll handle it with aplomb. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask all uh, unanimous consent to uh, offer into the record the statement of administration policy. Without objection, the statement of administration I won't bother um, uh, to read it just in the interest of time. Last week. Yes, ma'am. I wish we would read just the last paragraph. All right. <laughs> Thank you. The administration strongly opposes any inclusion of ideological and political provision that are beyond the scope of funding legislation. Should the Congress continue to include language that is not relevant to a funding debate, the administration will uh, oppose the bill, and the administration looks forward to working with the Congress as the fiscal year appropriation process moves forward. Um, last week, my good friend from Utah uh, rightly pointed to um, a, a provision of our founding in this country that allows that we provide for the uh, common defense. Um, it would seem to me that following that rationale that we would be prepared to make whatever sacrifices are necessary uh, to provide um, uh, for uh, the common um, our defense in our country and not locality by locality or municipality versus this state or that state. And when it comes to um, the enormous and consequential disasters of, uh, that people suffer um, in our country in various, uh, var various forms, uh, floods, fires, earthquakes, 
um, uh, winter uh, avalanches, floods. And um, I, I would use, Mr. Price, the example of the floods many years ago in North Carolina. It took us a good seven years here before, and I'm not certain that all of the money was still paid. Our last hurricanes in Florida, we still have not received, and that's quite some time ago, luckily, uh, we still have not received um, our funding. I'm disturbed that uh, as, as members sent here um, on both sides of the aisle, um, uh, that we um, uh, can't find it within ourselves or uh, to do what's necessary for urban area security initiatives. Uh, after 911, serving then on the Intelligence Committee, I was among the leaders here in Congress that advocated, or uh, I might add, Nine months before 911, I held um, a, a town hall meeting discussing the potential for terrorism. Uh, Saxby Chambliss and Jane Harmon and I uh, were a part of a committee um, nine months before 911 again uh, that went abroad um, um, uh, discussing uh, this particular matter. When I was a child, I learned that prior planning prevents poor performance, and many of you have used those same five Ps. And I can tell you right now that we are teeing up for those who would do us harm. Uh, sitting right here, right now, all they have to do, we don't, we don't know, for example, what Russia or China or um, any country does. We just do so many things so openly until people who would do us harm all they have to do is just watch television in the Rules Committee or on C-SPAN downstairs or what have you. Here we're going to cut out funding for mm, Las Vegas, which is a target. My home, Miami-Dade, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach, Orlando, Tampa, Atlanta, Baltimore, um, Charlotte, um, uh, Areas that Norfolk, Seattle, uh, the common sense uh, would tell all of us uh, that they are potential uh, targets, uh, and as is any place, uh, for uh, places to do harm. The question that I have for both you gentlemen, and I, I agree with and echo the sentiments of my colleagues thanking both of you, um, of the few members in Congress on both sides of the aisle, if I had confidence or uh, that um, I was reducing it uh, to two, uh, then I would choose either or both of you uh, as exemplars uh, for uh, trying to be bipartisan in difficult uh, uh, times uh, and in difficult financial times. But I've heard estimates that as many as 1,600 fire uh, our fighters may lose their jobs, and as Mr. McGovern said, it's very hard to quantify these things in advance. And uh, the administration position reflects, uh, I don't know whether it's hyperbole or what, but they reflect that 2,200 firefighters would lose their jobs. For the benefit of those who are here for the uh, 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 first time, my colleagues, uh, Mr. Reed, Mr. Nugent, Mr. Scott, and Mr. Webster, and Mr. Woodall, you all may not know that the city, if you live in this city, Washington, D.C., that it is woefully inadequate with reference to um, uh, uh, fires and addressing uh, emergencies of that kind. As many as seven years ago, uh, the Washington Fire Department cut down on their number of ladders and uh, the whole number of firefighters, in addition to the fact um, uh, that they began to cannibalize their vehicles um, uh, that they utilize. And we live in these apartment buildings, and you'd be amazed at the tardiness of the response time in a city that we know uh, is likely to be targeted. And I just use that as an example. Most of us come from areas where our cities have already laid off firefighters, have already laid off police officers who are considered first responders. And so the question that I have for both of you is, do you agree that firefighters are going to lose their jobs if this budget uh, were, uh, or this proposal, uh, 20, 
17, is it, um, or was to become law. And I might add, I won't bother to ask either of you if you think the Senate is going to pass it. If you do, then I know both of y'all don't smoke, but you would be smoking something if you thought the Senate was going to pass this to begin with. <laughs> but uh, do you all think firefighters, uh, if this were to become law, would actually lose their jobs? Mr. Adderholt, Mr. Price? I think one thing that uh, we have to bear in mind is the fact that um, in this bill, we have given great dis discretion to the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security uh, for uh, funding where she feels like that is needed. So she would have that discretion to put that money toward that uh, if she feels discretion. I, you know, I've certainly been one that has supported the firefighter grants, the firefighter, you know, uh, since my time in, in um, uh, Washington, and I think they're, they're these, both of these are great grants to uh, fund. The problem is just with the funding allocation that we have been given uh, for this has been so limited that we have had to make some very difficult choices. And, um, but we have allowed the Secretary to put those, that money where most necessary and where she feels like it is um, the uh, most needed uh, for security purposes. And so for that reason, uh, that uh, money uh, would be available. Mr. Pratt. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm uh, going to differ with uh, my, my chairman here, and maybe we can straighten this out, but my impression is that that, uh, that fungibility does not apply to the fire grants, that there is indeed in this bill a block granting of, of major grant programs. It's, it's reduced to a billion dollars, and there will be some fungibility among urban area grants and state grants and so forth, but fire grants are not in that mix. Well, the fire grants have a discrete appropriation, Absolutely. and that appropriation is $350 million, and that is, uh, that is less than half of the current year's funding for, for fire grants, for personnel and for equipment programs. The, and indeed, indeed, firefighters would lose their jobs. The, the best estimate that I've seen is 1,600 uh, jobs. The earlier estimate you had, 2,200 jobs, I think applied to H.R. 1, uh -huh. which... Uh, was uh, of course a total wipeout, but but the, uh, the and the problem is number one reduced funding and number two reduced flexibility because this uh, this bill would remove the waivers that have enabled the secretary to use these funds to um, avoid layoffs and to restore firefighters. The the the, the 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 under this bill will revert to the old rules that applied before the budget turned down. The 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 the, the uh, before the uh, budget uh, crisis, which has, um, which, which of course is a different set of rules, and we should apply when, when we're actually losing firefighter jobs. Man. So the waivers would would be uh, lost under this bill, as well as over half the money. I don't know whether any of you witnessed the gentleman outside with a funny getup that's yelling outside. He yelled at me and said that I was a pig and that I was the cause of uh, the problems that we have. And I was amused uh, at, uh, uh, at him. And I, all I know is this. Uh, if we don't attend to helping states and localities um, before disaster strikes, then it's going to be held to pay. And there are many aspects of this bill. The leases on homeland security uh, offices and what have you are going to cost more. Oh, you pay me now or you pay me later. And I don't know how we get there, but I know this much. We are beginning to become irrelevant. And I'm going to continue to say that until some Democrats and Republicans step up on both sides of uh, this uh, Congress and begin to pay attention to the fact that we can do this but we have to do it together, and it's going to be hard and painful. This is wrong, and I have great respect and admiration for my good friend, uh, uh, the chairman of this committee, as well as the ranking member. Uh, and they, whatever the allocation, all of that kind of stuff, um, that, uh, 10 Bs, 3, all of the little numbers and everything, don't add up to us needing the help and us needing to help each other. And until such time as we do that, uh, we all do ourselves a terrible disservice, and we do not provide for the common defense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, 
I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you, Mr. Adderholt, for, for having to, to go first uh, along these lines. I know that had to be tough, uh, tough for the both of you to sort that out. I sit on the Budget Committee uh, and I actually supported the RSC uh, budget, which, of course, would have been a tough one to come in uh, under. Here we are uh, in a budget that uh, doesn't balance for three decades. And we're talking about asking folks to step up and make tough, uh, tough decisions. Uh, and this is just the, the, the first year of those tough decisions, the easiest year of those tough decisions. I, I think about uh, my 125 days in Congress, Mr. Adholt, and I think, you know, I, I hadn't said yes to anybody yet. I hadn't been an opportunity to say yes. It's, it's all been about no, because when we were bar borrowing 42 cents uh, at every dollar before I showed up uh, here, if you're going to get your arms around that, uh, you have to say no more often than you, you say yes. Well, they tell me we could double income taxes uh, today and balance the budget this year, but we'd be back out of whack uh, next year with double-digit increases in, uh, in uh, discretionary and with continuing rising uh, in, the, in the entitlements. So I can't imagine the, the, the challenge of going line by line as, as you all had to do uh, in your uh, committee and finding that delicate uh, balance. Uh, but it means a lot uh, as one of the new guys that, uh, for you all to come here and say, and let's make it an open uh, rule and see what we can do to make it better, even though we've worked our very best to craft uh, uh, this. I know that had historically been a, a, a process in the House that you'd bring these bills under an open uh, rule, but clearly that's not always uh, easy to do, uh, and you all have, have asked uh, to do that, and that, that means a, a lot uh, to me. I'll be studying uh, those, uh, those votes in committee and those line-by-line -line, uh, questions, because I, I agree with Mr. Hastings. Uh, now's the time for folks to step up. Uh, I got asked uh, over the Memorial Day weekend why it is that teachers, firefighters, and policemen are always the first ones to lose their budgets uh, from Washington, D.C. And the answer was because policemen, firefighters, and teachers don't get funded out of Washington, D.C. That's traditionally something that I fund in my neighborhood. I promise you, uh, my city of Lawrenceville is not borrowing 42 cents out of every dollar that it spends. Uh, my county of Gwinnett is not borrowing 42 cents out of every dollar that it spends. My state of Georgia is not borrowing 42 cents out of every dollar that it spends. And when we get involved in things that we should not have gotten involved in, uh, clearly somebody depends on every single one of these dollars. And again, I can only imagine uh, the challenges that you all face because I know you heard from each and every one of those folks who depends on these dollars. But again, associating myself with, with Mr. Hastings, we have to step up. Uh, and you all have stepped up in, in making this. And I just, am, again, as a first-timer, first appropriations uh, bill I've seen, I'm just tremendously uh, proud uh, to be associated uh, with it. And I, I don't have any questions, Mr. Chairman. Paulus, no questions. Mr. Nugent, no questions. Scott, Webster, Reed. Gentlemen, thank you both very much for being here. We appreciate your uh, hard work. And look forward to what I know will be a fascinating three-point day on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That will uh, thank uh, you. conclude the uh, hearing portion for uh, consideration of H.R. 2017. Oh, we are. Okay. Apparently the rule is not quite ready yet, uh, so we're going to recess for um, just a few minutes. I have no idea how long it's going to take, but I'm just told that we're going to have to recess and wait for the rule to come forward. So everybody stands in recess.
The uh, Rules Committee will reconvene. Uh, we are here for further consideration of the rule for allowing consideration of H.R. 2017, and the Chair will be in receipt of a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move the Committee grant H.R. 2017, the Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Act 2012, an open rule. The rule provides for one hour of general debate on the bill, equally divided and controlled by the Chair and Ranking Minority Member on the Committee on Appropriation. Rule waives all points of order against consideration of the bill. Rule waives all points of order against provisions in the bill for failure to comply with Clause 2 of Rule 21 are waived except for Section 536. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. The rule authorizes the Chair to accord priority in recognition to members who have pre-printed their amendments in the Congressional record. The rule provides one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2 of the rule provides that H. Conrad's 34, including the related 302A allocations printed in the Rules Committee report accompanying the resolution, shall have force and effect until a conference report on the concurrent resolution on the budget for fiscal year 2012 is adapted. You've heard the motion of the gentleman. Um, let me just say, uh, as I did at the outset of the, of the hearing, we have had... Um, Lots of legislation in the 112th Congress considered under modified open rules, meaning that every member who has uh, had a germane amendment that complied with the rules of the House could file that amendment in the record the night before consideration on the floor, and uh, it would be um, in order for them to consider it. That's a modified open rule, and we've had, as I said, uh, many of those, I guess, beginning with H.R. 1, which was uh, the first uh, one that we had. But this is the first actual open rule. Speaker Boehner indicated a speech that he gave last fall that he wanted to uh, see us proceed with an open amendment process for the uh, appropriations um, bills that were coming forward. We um, had uh, <clears throat> we had the, the, uh, a rule considered under an open amendment process in uh, July 21st, I think it's 2007. It says 2011 on my, on this talking point here. But so it's been uh, a while and... 119 members, as I said, uh, have not had uh, the opportunity to enjoy uh, an open amendment process. It was pretty close to that again, as I said, when we considered H.R. 1. But uh, we will be proceeding, I hope, uh, under an open amendment process. There was talk earlier about what the definition of an open rule is, and you, uh, Ms. Slaughter, read uh, your definition of an open rule, and we've been doing some research and um, we have not found the last time that we've had what was described as an open rule plus. I know that um, you changed the definition of um, the open amendment process in the last Congress, making a modified open rule designated as an open rule. And um, it does take an extraordinary uh, process. A standard open rule is uh, a measure that is considered under the um, open amendment process. And so, again, it would take extraordinary action for this committee to uh, actually uh, provide uh, the kind of waiver protection. And um, I know that Mr. Price made a very compelling argument for his amendment, and I've discussed it with him on the House floor. And in the discussion that I just had with him, uh, I indicated that he clearly can offer his amendment. He just needs to find offsets for the uh, spending increases that he is seeking. And uh, I encourage him to do that. He said he has tried and has uh, been unable to, but um, his priorities can clearly be uh, established there. So um, if he believes the proposals that he has are more important than, uh, than other items within the bill, he can obviously offer that amendment under the open amendment process. So are there any uh, amendments to the rule? Well, uh, Mr. S uh, Chairman, if I may, I'd like Surely. to tell you that I was reading earlier from the Survey of Activities of the House Committee on Rules, the 109th Congress Report Committee on Rules that you signed, and I marked the spot for you. Is this a gift? That it's a gift. Me? Okay. <laughs> so is this something you want me to read then, right but now? But I would also, not at all, just read it at your leisure. I just know you'll want to remember it. Uh, well, so, okay, let, let, a, no, let's, let, me, let me just ask. Let me, I, mean, I, I thank you for that, and I will read it. I All look right. forward to reading it. But um, are, are you saying that it does not take an extraordinary action under the open amendment process no. to provide waivers 
for a particular amendment that is beyond the underlying legislation that's before us? It quite clearly says here that a member can offer it and can get a waiver. Yeah, this so committee has to. No, I, I, well, okay. I'm, so I'm, you're, so you've just said one, but so uh, so you've just said so you've just well, confirmed exactly me. what I've said. No, what you and said. that is that is that you are asking that we provide extraordinary protection for a proposal yeah. that the gentleman yeah. obviously offered. I assume at the subcommittee and at the full committee mm -hmm. level. I don't know that. Well, but I, I mean, I, I assume know. that he did because he's established his priorities. Well, anyway, if I we, could reclaim my time, just I mean, what I do know is it said. I don't right know that you were ever recognized. Here. What you said uh, was that. Uh, well, I mean, did you call for amendments? Well, I called right. for discussion. And I will do that. Okay, I will discuss yeah. it. All right. Uh, that um, what we uh, read here today and what we said here today and what you said to Mr. Price. I think this contradicts that, that if Mr. Price were to be given a waiver, that it would negate the open. Well, I never, said that Mr. I, I never said that Mr. Price could not be given a waiver. What I said is under the would standard, the open rule can you tell me the last time that we had a bill that uh, actually had an appropriation measure come forward that considered under an open amendment process that provided a waiver for an extraordinary amendment beyond that? No, but we'll find it. Well, we've been looking, okay. and uh, to our knowledge, we haven't been able to find one. So if, is there, are there amendments? I do have general? an amendment, yes. Uh, I uh, move the committee make an order separately and provide any necessary waivers. For amendment number one, offered by the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Price, which would increase by $460 million, the amount of funded provided in the bill for firefighter assistance, bringing it up to the FY 2011 level, offset by designating as an emergency requirement Four hundred and sixty million provided for the disaster relief fund, and amendment number two, also offered by Mr. Price, would increase by eight hundred and fifty million the amount of funded provided for FEMA state and local grant programs, offset by designating as an emergency requirement all funds provided above the president's budget request for the disaster relief fund. And I just want to make one comment: what we're doing on the uh, three hundred two. The allocations here are on same with the Ryan budget. Yes, um, let me just let me just say that uh, one of the things that we are doing in this in this is the standard procedure that has existed in the past it includes a provision establishing budget enforcement rules until the Congress adopts a permanent budget resolution. That's both houses of Congress for fiscal year 2012. It uses the numbers of the House passed budget resolution until there's a conference report. It will establish the new levels, and because the Rules Committee had to correct the language reported by the Budget Committee prior to consideration of the budget resolution, 302A levels that normally would have been carried in the Budget Committee report need to be revised and are carried in the Rules Committee report. These numbers reflect, as the gentleman has correctly said, the House passed budget resolution. The Chair of the Budget Committee has also given technical authority to revise the allocations to reflect enhancement and enactment of the, uh, of the 2011 continuing resolution and the Finally, the uh, provision extends the authority regarding emergency designations contained in HRES 5 as adopted by the House for fiscal year 2011 items. I mention it just because we've already voted on it once, and there's been a pretty sound repudiation of it, uh, parts of it anyway, and I just was surprised you wanted to vote for it again. But uh, yes, I will. I just, I'm clear. So we're operating under the assumption that the Ryan budget is in place, including, I would assume, the Medicare provision that's in the Ryan budget. Which is the standard procedure okay, for no, consideration of these measures. Sure that there. We know that the Medicare provisions and the cutbacks would be assumed by passing this rule. Thank you. Well, I don't know that there are any cutbacks in, in Medicare. I mean, it's my understanding that the, that the budget well, ending actually Medicare saves. You know it. Yeah. I, I understand that this, <laughs> the proposal that we have saves Medicare. Is, uh, in terms of a I, voucher I, system, yeah. Well, I've already read my you've heard, the, you've, heard the, you've heard that you've heard the the uh, amendment of the gentlewoman. I think we've pretty well exhausted our discussion on this. Mr. Webster. I just had a question, Mr. Chair. Um, if the Ryan budget, well, no, I'll say yes, it does. It spends all the cash available, plus it takes some borrowed money. So if we spend above that budget limit that we set in this committee by passing that budget, then it was set by the floor that we could assume that all the extra monies is borrowed, all of it. It's not the 42 cents on a dollar. This is 100 percent borrowed money if we were to vote on it. So it would be like an employer taking a credit card and paying his employees for an entire year on a credit card. Is that correct? The gentleman's absolutely right. Um, and I 
think that we've made some tough decisions, and the House has passed this budget resolution, and it's, um, in fact, the uh, guide that we're going to be using as we proceed with the appropriations process. And well, we thank you. on the uh, slaughter amendment, those in favor will say aye. 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 Those don't pay the chair, they'll say aye. Roll call, please. Call the roll. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Sessions, no. Ms. Fox? No. Ms. Fox, no. Mr. Bishop? No. Mr. Bishop, no. Mr. Woodall? No. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Nugent? No. Mr. Nugent, no. Mr. Scott? No. Mr. Scott, no. Mr. Webster? No. Mr. Webster, no. Mr. Reed? No. Mr. Reed, no. Ms. Slaughter? Aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern? Aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings? Aye. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis? Mr. Chairman? No. Report the total. Three yeas, nine nays. And the motion is not agreed to. Are there further amendments? Not the vote occurs on the motion of the gentleman from uh, Dallas. Those in favor will say aye. Those in favor aye. Aye. No. The ayes have it. Roll call, please. Kirk, call the roll on the open rule. Mr. Sessions. Aye. Mr. Sessions, aye. Ms. Fox. Aye. Ms. Fox, aye. Mr. Bishop. Aye. Mr. Bishop, aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall, aye. Mr. Nugent. Mr. Nugent, aye. Mr. Scott, aye. Mr. Scott, aye. Mr. Webster, yes. Mr. Webster, aye. Mr. Reed, aye. Mr. Reed, aye. Ms. Slaughter, no. Ms. Slaughter, no. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis, Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk reports total. Nine ayes, three noes. And the motion is agreed to, and uh, the newest member of this committee, Mr. Reed, will be managing for the majority. And Mr. Polis. And Mr. Polis for the minority. We'll look forward to an interesting debate on this rule.